Now, our, uh, obviously, the Christian life that we live is one that we have to rely on our faith. You know, God's a God that is not physically here. You know, Jesus Christ doesn't walk around the earth today. We know this. So everything that we do and everything that we believe is based on faith. Um, we know that God is all-powerful. He's created the heavens and the earth, and we know that because it's found in God's Word. And many of us have experienced, you know, um, God's power in our own lives, where we have seen prayers answered. We've seen a lot of good things happen. We can look back and say, you know what, the finger of God had to be in this. For, for things have worked out the way that they have. Just like it is with when you look around and just look at nature and look at his creation, that there's no way that this stuff just happened by chance. There had to be someone involved in that. We see evidence of God in our life. But what it's so easy to do is to kind of forget who God is and forget that he really is there, especially when it comes to our own sins and the, and the way that we live our life. And what I'm going to be preaching this morning, hopefully, is a sermon to exhort you and to admonish you on your sins and, and, and the way that you view them in, in a way that, um, you know, we could have a healthy fear of the Lord. Because it's too easy to just continue along our life and you do things wrong, you do something wrong, and you just, oh, well, God's, you know, God's love, God's love, and that's all anyone ever hears, not in this church, but just in general. And it, it, you, you get this, this warped perception, and you just think, well, everything's just always fine all the time, because, I mean, God's just God's love. And I'm not going to go into all of God's wrath this morning, but what I am going to do is we're going to go through... As many examples as I could think of, and if you could think of another one after service, let me know. I was trying to, to figure this out uh, yesterday. I was preparing for a sermon. Of all the people that were killed directly by God. By God and God, and these are individuals. So we know that God has, has brought judgment upon nations. We know that He's used you know whole groups of people and nations to bring judgment on other people. So in a, in a sense, there God was you know destroying entire nations or even civilizations. But that's not what I'm referring. To. I'm talking about individuals because we're all individuals here this morning, and there are even many saved individuals and examples in the Bible, people who are children of God. And God took their life early. And this is a reminder for us that we need to be aware of and we need to know, hey, we can't just do whatever you want. There are consequences for our actions and that might even mean losing your life. Now think about that. I know everybody in here today is either, you know, the family's here or you have a spouse or whatever. And I mean, think about it right off the bat. If you, you know, when you die, you're leaving behind whoever. And if it's a result of your sin, that's definitely not going to leave your, your loved ones in a good situation. Right now, we know that, that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. We know that God can work things good. So, um, but you, as, as an individual, you know, because we're going to be looking at sin. These are all a result of sin. It's not, it's not something like, like Stephen who was martyred for the glory of God. His life was ended early, but you know what? That wasn't because of any sin that he was in. It's because that he was giving up his life and he was enduring unto the end and he was preaching the Lord and did a great work in his life who happened to be, that was the end of his accomplished work. I mean, even Jesus Christ only lived to be roughly 33 years old, right? I mean, that's, you, you look at, at the extent of his life, it was cut short. I mean, he was in his prime when, when he was put to death. But it was all for a great cause. It was all good. And we know that he never sinned. So it's not that, you know, someone losing their life is a necessary matter of, uh, of sinning. But we're looking at examples of people who did sin. And that was the result is that God just said, that's it. You, you've crossed the line and now you've lost your life. And you've lost any more opportunities to earn rewards, to do other things. And, you know, people will say... Well, how is that a punishment? I mean, just going home to heaven to be with God. Well, there's a lot of work for us to do in this life. And once you're done, I mean, once you breathe your last breath, there's no more work to be done. And this is, this is the place where our war rewards are determined. I mean, once the flesh is gone, once you're in heaven, once you know you're not sinning, you, you can't sin anymore at all. There's no rewards to be earned there. I mean, God's got work for you to do, but, but that's it. I mean, you've established where you're going to be at. In the afterlife, 
already when you breathe in that space. You want to be able to, to reach as many people. And, and just think about others for a minute, too. I mean, it's a very selfish view to say, oh, well, if God ends your life early, then you know, that's just a good thing anyways. And people will use that type of argument when we preach about you know, if someone commits suicide that's saved, they go to heaven. Oh, well, then why wouldn't we all just kill ourselves when we go to heaven? Well, that's just a pretty dumb, self-centered argument anyways. I mean, if you care about other people, and that's why I brought up at the beginning, your loved ones, your spouse, children, parents, whatever. You ought to love them and care about them and other people, friends, family, you know, extended people, and just the lost in general. When you, When your life is gone... You lose all the opportunity then to get to lead those people to Christ and get them saved and, and to bring them to heaven with you. And that's what our life here is all about. So let's look here in James chapter 1. Look at verse number 13. The Bible reads, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now, I don't think that's just referring to the second death. Because we know that all, you know, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God, we know that the wages of sin is death. But we could see in many cases that this judgment, the result of sin, is not just the second death. Because God has extended people's lives early. And we need to be aware, you know, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. Your own fleshly, physical lust, whatever it is that's desiring something that you shouldn't desire, whatever sin that may be, when you're enticed, it's based on your own lust. And when lust is conceived, that's when sin, that's when sin happens. And then he says the end result of sin is death. And we need to be aware of this because you don't want to be stuck in your sin and then just God's like, well, I'm done with you. Turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter 19. And I, and I put these in order, like, I don't want to say chronological, but chronological in the Bible. So we're going to be turning, just going to keep on moving forward in our Bibles. These are all the examples that I could just come up with. I think I got them all, but I don't want to say that 100% for sure. Genesis chapter 19. Of course, this is uh, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. We're going to see our first example here in Genesis 19. So look at verse number 17. It says, It came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee. Neither stay thou in all the plain, escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. This is when the angels were leading Lot and his wife and his family out of Sodom. And their, their commandment unto them was, don't look behind you. You know, don't stay in the plain, like, get out of here and get to the mountain. Don't look back, just keep on going and get out of here, lest you be consumed too. And jump down to verse 24, it says, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. There's no doubt about it. That's a supernatural death. That is an occurrence. I mean, she looked behind her. She did what she wasn't for, what she was commanded not to do. She sinned by looking back on Sodom. And what happened instantly? Boom, she became a pillar of salt. Dead. Great example of, hey, God said something. This is a, this is a commandment for the Lord. Now, you can say, oh, no, but the angels just said that. Yeah, but it, they were acting, they were speaking on behalf of the Lord. I mean, this is in God's word, and we know that they were giving them a direct commandment from the Lord. When God makes a statement, when God makes a commandment, when God says, hey, thou shalt not do thus and so, we need to take him seriously. We need, we need to be able to understand, hey, there's consequences of this. We can't just say, you know what, but I just want to get one more look. You say, well, well, what harm was in that? Who was she hurting by looking back? Doesn't matter. 
Now, there are other implications if you really want to dig into it. You can say, well, what about, you know, when she's looking back, cause other people to have, you know, you, can have, you always have an influence on other people. But we need to look at this and say, wow, you know, that's, that's, pretty, uh, that's pretty serious. I don't want to say extreme because I don't think it's extreme. I think what God does is just and right. And when, but when God says something, he's saying, you need to listen. You need to adhere to what I'm saying. Turn if you were to Genesis chapter 38. We see the next two people. You know, and it reminds me too of just in God's law when, uh, with in the early days when God had given the law to Moses and and, he, and Moses declared it unto the people. And you know, one of the laws was not breaking the Sabbath day, doing no work. And then what happened? Right away, as soon as God gave the commandment, which is what happened here, as soon as God gave the commandment, as soon as they hear about it, it's like, well, no, I just want to do it anyways. It's almost like, would you have even turned around if you didn't say that? You know, like are you, you just gotta 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 press it and test the, the issue. It, with um, you know, the man that was gathering sticks. I'm saying, well, he was just gathering sticks. What's, what's the harm in that? What's the big deal? Well, you're breaking God's law. And he said not to do it. And he's so serious about it. He says, you're going to be put to death. Now, that guy's not included in this study because it wasn't specifically God that was just killing him. He was someone who broke the law and they carried out the, the law. But um, it's just another example of how serious God's laws are. You know, when he says something, we need to follow it. And um, But look at Genesis chapter 38. We're going to see our next two examples in this one story here. Verse number 6 says, And Judah took a wife of Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. Look at it, it was flat out, God just, just, he was wicked, and God killed him. Now, we don't know if, if Ur or Onan were saved. I mean, he, he, there's just not enough evidence in the Bible. We would, I, I would think that they would be just because they're the son of Judah. And, you know, one of the, one of the you know, grandchild of, of Israel, you would think that, that Israel was leading his household well enough to be able to at least get his, his family saved. I mean, we don't know. It's all speculation. But regardless, this will apply, and we'll see this later anyways, with way more clear examples of people who we know for sure. Because we don't know if Lot's wife was saved either. Don't know. But there are plenty of examples of people that we do know for sure were saved, yet were killed by God. So here, Ur was just wicked in the sight of the Lord. God just killed him. God said, fine, I'm done with you. And we don't know in what manner he did that. It could be, it could have been a heart attack. It could be something like that. And people would say, oh, wow, he's just unlucky. You know, and you look at people today, and you say, well, I don't know, is God even killing people today? I would say probably. Probably. I would say, why not? I mean, he's done it, and we're going to see many examples of this. I would say, yeah, but I mean, we may not recognize it as such because it might be some freak accident, something that just happens like, wow, that's weird. But you just explain it away. We have the benefit of knowing from his word right here. No, this is God did this. God killed him. And then uh, keep reading here. And Judah said unto Onan, verse number eight. Go in unto thy brother's wife and marry her and raise up seed to thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his. And it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground, lest that he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord. Wherefore he slew him also. So yeah, Onan just did something here that people are doing today all the time. And it says here that that the thing that he did that, that displeased God. God was angry with that so much that he said, well, he killed him also. He said, that's it. You're done. You're, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. And he took his life. Turn to Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter number 10. Now, while we know that, that God's law applies to everybody, God's holy law and God's um, judgment of sin, 
It is applied equally to everybody as far as the wages of sin being death and the, you know, and the second death being a required punishment. Uh, but for those of us who are saved, for those of us who have received forgiveness through Jesus Christ, I think more is expected now as a child of God than of the unsaved world. Now, it doesn't mean you know, they're still going to be judged. You know, and, and we are still judged in a way. We're not going to receive that eternal punishment because Christ has already paid for that. And has fulfilled that judgment for us. But I believe in most of these cases, if not all, even though I can't prove it, that God is holding these people to a higher standard. The sons of Judah are probably held to a higher standard because I said, you know, there's people doing this all the time. But what is expected of them? You know, unto whom much is given, the Bible says, shall much be required. And the more knowledge you have and the more you know, there's going to be a lot more required of you. And if you got an angel directly telling you, hey, don't look back, you know, I think that's kind of a, a lot more is required of you at that point. When, when you have, you know, Moses coming down from the mount with the Ten Commandments and saying, look, this is what God just said. You just saw him, you know, in the clouds and in the fire and all the miracles and everything that was done. You know, this is, this is what he's saying to do. And you just say, well, whatever. Leviticus chapter 10, here's another example of, the, of, this, of exactly what I'm just saying too. Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron. Look at verse number 1 of Leviticus 10. It says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Moses spotted that that was the hand of God right there, that they died. It wasn't just some freak pyrotechnics error, you know, where they died in when, when the fire came out and consumed Nadab and Abihu. Now, they were given explicit instructions. And you read through the law, you read through Exodus, you, you read through. It is very, God is very specific on his order of, of the way everything needs to be done. The way that the sacrifices are made. The way that the, you know, just, just everything from start to finish. There is very much detail. Detail on the tabernacle, how it's supposed to be built. Everything God says, this is how you do it. He says, when you offer up incense, he gave them the ingredients. This is what you put in it. This is what I want when you offer up this incense within the house of the Lord, within the tabernacle. This is what you need to do. And they said, you know what? This is great, but I've got a better idea. And you can say, but they were serving God. They were just trying to bring their best, but it's not what God told them to do. And they lost their lives as a result of that. They lost their lives. Ah, oh, there's one more example here. It's not in my notes. Where is uh, the, the story of Uzzah? Yeah. When he put forth his hand, when they were bringing the ark of God back. Yeah. All right, I'm, gonna, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the reference for you right now. I don't want to take the time to go and find it. But um, that'll probably be in like Second Samuel, because David is king. It's got to be early on in Second Samuel. David's king, and you know the Philistines had taken the the Ark of God when they dis- defeated Saul and Jonathan in battle, and they took away the Ark of the Lord, and they had it, and then they were being cursed and everything, so they were sending it back. And David went to go and recover the Ark of God. He was going to bring it back into Jerusalem and then say, you know, because they were finally defeating the Philistines. And um, he says, you know, they they finally got it back because the Philistines sent it away. And then they had it on a cart. See, when the Philistines sent it away, they sent it out on a cart. They put it on, you know, they they had animals bring it and on wheels and stuff. And they saw it like, wow, that's a pretty good idea. Right? Why don't we do this? Why don't we, why don't we do what the heathen's doing and put it on a cart? But see, God had prescribed in the law that it's supposed to be carried. That they had rods or staves that would come out of the ark and that they had to physically carry And that was God's method of transportation of the ark. Chapter 6. Chapter 6. Second, thank you. Let's turn there. Second Samuel chapter 6. Verse 7. This is the part where they get to. Thank you. Second Samuel chapter 6 
verse number 7. We'll start reading in verse number 6. It says, and when, they, and when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. All he did was, I mean, get what happened here. They had the ark on a cart. And the oxen that were, that were driving that cart, they got scared, you know, it was a bump, and then Uzzah sees, hey, the ark of God's going to tip over, it's going to fall, we want it to break. So he's putting up his hand to keep it steady. Right, he's saying, I'm just, I'm just looking out for you, we got to make sure, boom, killed. Killed, you see, but he was doing the right thing, you know, that's, that should never have happened. And it's because they were in disobedience and David didn't understand this either at the time. It says in verse 8, And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And see, this is what this is the point of the sermon. This is one of the, there's two main points I'm trying to get across. This is one of them. David all of a sudden got a fear of the Lord that day. It's a wake-up call. It's something that says, okay, wow, wait, we really need to be careful and serious about how we serve God and how we live our lives, that we are serving a Lord that's able to just extinguish your life in a second because He's a holy God, and when He says something, He means it. Amen. He had, and look, it's not God's fault that they were ignorant. It's not God's fault that they didn't know His Word well enough to know that, no, 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 no. Hey, this is what the heathen did. You may look like a good idea, but God told us to carry it. We need to use the staves. He never said to use a cart. Do you think God didn't know about the wheel? Like it's some new invention? He could have made it easier on them, because I'm sure it was. It's a lot easier to, to bring something on a cart than it is to carry it on your shoulders. But he didn't make it easy on him in that sense. He didn't say, oh, okay, we got to put on a cart. This is how you do it. Right. And it needs to be followed. And, and all of God's commands are that way. We need to be looking at them seriously. And we, you know what? We need to be able to look at these stories and get our own fear of the Lord and say, you know what? I don't want God to strike me dead for being so flippant about serving Him. Eh, God's not going to care. Because look, God is extremely merciful, extremely long-suffering, really loving, and, and, and can take a lot and, and will absorb a lot and will allow us a lot because we're, you know, we do make mistakes and that is evident. But we don't want to get so comfortable with the fact that God is so loving and merciful that we're just like, hey, God won't care. Oh, uh, that's fine. Yeah, I always make mistakes. God, so God just looks over anyways. It's not a big deal. That is a really bad attitude to have with God. Flip, if you would turn, if you would, to um, 1 Kings chapter number 13. So it, just, it worked out perfect because now we're still going in order. We're following along the, the path here. 1 Kings chapter 13. We're going to see another example here of someone that lost his life. Now this was definitely a saved man. This was a child of God. So if you have any doubts, well, just like I believe Nadab and Abihu were too, the sons of Aaron, you know, in the priest's office, they, they were, you know, selected, chosen by God to, to carry out that function. Excuse me. I believe they were saved individuals and God brought the death penalty on Uzzah, we don't know, but 1 Kings chapter 13. This is the story of the man of God that went out to um, rebuke Jeroboam in, the, in the, um, the altar that he built up and rebuke his sins. He was sent in there. And you, if you remember, you know, the, the king reached out. He was like, you know, he was like basically, like, get that guy. And his, and his hand just, just froze up. And then um, this man of God had to pray that, that he would be able to uh, use his hand again. And what happened was he was told to go into the city, preach his message, and go out another way. He said, don't stay there, don't tarry. You go in, 
you preach the message, and you leave, and you get out of there. That was what he was instructed to do. Look at verse number 20 of 1 Kings 13. It says, And it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. So, I, and, and yeah, I, okay, this is what I have in here. Just to give you a little bit more background and context of the story, you probably all know it. But as he was leaving, so he preached his message, the king tried to say, hey, come back with me. And he tried to like bless him and get him to come back. And he said, nope, can't do it. God said, I can't do it. You know, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm out of here. And he was and at that point, he was doing what was right according to what God had told him to do. But as he's leaving, then this other prophet came out and said, hey, Wait a minute, you know, come back with me. And he says, nope, can't do it. You know, God said, I gotta go. And, he said, and, and then the, this other prophet lied to him and said, well, you know what? I, an angel came and spoke to me and said that you need to come back with me and have dinner at my house. You know, basically, you know, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but he's like, you need to come back with me because this angel told me. So the word of the Lord said, you need to come back with me. So the man of God, instead of heeding to what he already knew, to what he knew to be the word of God, he knew for a fact that this was the truth, then listen to what someone else was telling him that he had no way of verifying. He had no way of knowing that that was the word of the Lord. But he just, and, and it contradicted what God had already told him. It was the exact opposite of what God said. So he, from that, he should have known that God's not going to contradict himself. He's not going to say, oh, now you can go ahead and turn back. But look at verse number 20. It says, And it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord. See, now he's really getting a message from God. Before he was lying to him. Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back and hast eaten bread and drunk water in the place of the which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water. Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. And it came to pass, after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk, that he saddled for him the ass to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way, and the ass stood by it. The lion also stood by the carcass. And behold, men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way, and the lion standing by the carcass. And they came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. And when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, It is the man of God who is disobedient unto the word of the Lord. Therefore the Lord hath delivered him unto the lion." which hath torn him and slain him according to the word of the Lord, which he spake unto him. And again, another example, I mean, there's just a, a lion killed him, right? You can say, wow, that's weird. You know, his ass is just sitting there, the lion didn't attack the ass, and the lion's just standing by this body now that he killed, and he's not going after anybody else. Yeah. That's kind of a weird situation. Yeah, because it was from the Lord, because God killed him. It wasn't just some freak accident. That was the judgment of God upon this individual that disobeyed the commandment of the Lord. He had a direct commandment from God, and he disobeyed it. Turn, if you would, to chapter 20, 1 Kings chapter 20. That's another interesting example here. Verse number 35, 1 Kings 20, verse 35 says, And a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor in the word of the Lord, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man refused to smite him. So he's, here's one of the sons of the prophets. He goes up to this guy and he's like, Hit me. Hit me. Now he's, it says here he did it in the word of the Lord. It was God's word to, for him to hit him. But the guy refused. The guy is like, no, I'm not going to hit you. Look at verse number 36. Then said he unto him, because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou art departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he was departed from him, a lion found him and slew him. God killed this man for not hitting the other guy. Now, you might have a lot of reason to think, well, why would God do that? But it's because, he even says here, because I was not obeyed the voice of the Lord. If God is telling you to do something, 
Even if it's hitting some guy in the face, which I'm not saying that, that we're having this type of... God told me to hit him. I had to do it because I don't want a lion to kill me. Don't use this as an excuse to go out and punch people in the face. All right? This is the word of God that was being revealed unto the, you know, individuals at this time. We don't have the word of God being revealed unto us anymore. We have the full revelation of God's word. We don't have God directly speaking to individuals and giving them this extra biblical knowledge of, of God's word and saying to do these things. I mean, that's like a Pentecostal belief. That's these, these charismatics that believe in that type of stuff. But we don't. We believe that God's word is complete. We don't, we don't believe that God's just telling people like, you know, Joseph Smith that, that, oh, you need to go out and start this religion and, you know, I'm going to send my angels to tell you all about this. You know, that's the cults. They believe that type of stuff. But this is, again, another direct disobedience to God's word. And it may seem a little odd because you, you don't see that really anywhere else in scripture of, of, of a man being you know, told to, to hit someone else in the face. But God had a purpose for him because this man was going to send a message and he needed to be to have his you know, face beaten up a little bit. And um, anyways, you can read the whole story for that. But that's just one more example here of being disobedient. And it's, you know, it's the same theme that we're finding. It's all disobedience to God's command, disobedient to the word of the Lord, to God's direct commandment. These people are not listening to it and not doing what they were told to do. First Chronicles, first Chronicles, chapter 10. First Chronicles, chapter 10 is going to give us the, um, the more of the reasoning behind Saul's death as opposed to, you know, in first Samuel. At the you know chapter thirty one, you see where where uh, Saul and Jonathan died, but here we get the you know the actual reasoning behind it. You say, oh well, he died in war, right? They were just beat by the by the Philistines. But it says in verse thirteen of chapter 10, 1 Chronicles chapter ten verse thirteen, it says, so Saul died for his transgression which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord which he kept not. And also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it and inquired not of the Lord. Therefore, he slew him and turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. And again, another person that is saved. Saul was 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 a saved man. He was one of the at one point he was, you know, preaching God's word. The spirit of God came upon him. He was preaching God's word and he did good early, early on in his life when he was humble and little in his own eyes before he was lifted up with pride and the power of being king kind of took over his way of thinking. And he became real proud and not willing to humble himself before God and continue to just think that he was always right, even when he was being rebuked. And we went over that a couple weeks ago. But we see here the reasoning for Saul's death. It's coming from God. He's saying, look, he didn't keep the word of the Lord. Because remember before, he offered up the sacrifice, which wasn't lawful for him to do. That was Samuel's job. Samuel was a little bit late getting there. And Saul said, well, i got to just do this. i got to take matters in my own hands. And broke God's law of who is supposed to even be doing the sacrifices. Saul was, was a Benjamite. And the Benjamites have no service for God. That was for the Levites. I mean, that's under the old law. That's who was supposed to do it. And Samuel was the priest, and he was the one supposed to be performing the sacrifice. Saul did it. So that was one of the reasons. And then when he went and consulted a witch, that was it. God said, that's it. You know, you, you, you broke my law here twice, and that's why I'm killing you. He slew him for those reasons. Turn if you would to Acts chapter number 5. So those are all obviously Old Testament examples. We're going to see one New Testament example to say, hey, you know, it wasn't just something that happened in the Old Testament. Not that God changes anyways. Not that it would discount what all these stories that happened. But we're going to see a New Testament example of the same thing happening here. And again, this is with Ananias and Sapphira. I believe that they were saved. I have no reason to think that they weren't. They were part of the early church. But they sinned. Look at, uh, we're going to start reading in verse number 1 of Acts chapter 5. The Bible reads, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira his wife sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? 
and to keep back part of the price of the land. Whilst it remained, whilst it remained in thine, excuse me, whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. And it came to pass, excuse me, and it was about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in, and Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yeah, yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. So again, we're seeing you know, supernatural death. God is killing these people. He said, you didn't lie unto us. When they, when they sold their property and were claiming to give all the proceeds unto the church. Yeah, you know, we love what you're doing right now. We're going to sell what we have here. We're giving all the church. And Peter even explains that, you know what, you didn't have to do that. It was under your own power. You could have done whatever you wanted. And people can make these mistakes, these sins, and think that, like, oh, it's not that big. I'm still doing something good. And there's all kinds of rationale and, and, and justification for their actions. And after I asked this fire, I said, well, but look at how much we were still giving under the church. I mean, yeah, we kept back a little bit, but we gave all this other stuff. Isn't that still good? Doesn't that still help? But see, God doesn't care about that. God didn't care about the sacrifice that Saul was making. I mean, he wanted it done right more than he wanted the sacrifice. God said, you know, the Bible says it's better to obey. The you know, obedience is better than sacrifice. That that is, is it, you know, we need to be very, and that's why we, you know, we may be called legalistic or whatever. It's because we care about God's word. We can see these stories and we don't want to be foolish about the things that we do with our life because we try to have a fear of God. Amen. Just like the early church did after Ananias and Sapphira fell down dead. You know what? They heard and they feared. They said, wow, we better make sure we are doing things right. Turn your to Matthew chapter 10. I'm done. Those are all the examples that I had. So if you could think of any others that, that stand out to you, let me know after service. I'm, you know, I, I'm just, I, I, like I said, I'm trying to, I was trying to remember all of them. But um, I, I very well could have missed one somewhere. I'm not sure. But um, regardless, you get the point. There's plenty of examples here to show that it wasn't just a one-time thing. This has happened many times throughout the Bible. God takes His Word seriously. How seriously do you take God's Word? How important is it to you to be doing the right thing? Or do you just say, well, yeah, I know the Bible says to do that, but it's kind of hard, it's difficult, I don't really want to do that. I, you know, I, He'll be okay with me just doing this. You better be confident about that. People have lost their lives. For having that type of an attitude. <clears throat> Today, have you turned to Matthew 10? Look at verse number 28. There's many reasons to have a healthy fear of the Lord. This is one example of what we've seen here. The Bible says in Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. They say, you know what? Don't fear man, is what he's saying there. You know, what man can do to you, they could kill your body. That's, the, that's about the worst that they could do. They could, they could take your life as they wait for He said, but God's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. God, God is way more powerful than man. We ought, to be able to, we ought to be fearing him and not man. I mean, you say, well, but they might put me to death. Yeah, but God might put you to death. Right. Flip back, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to preach on, on something specific now. 
You all, you all know, should know what your own sins are in your own life, and I'm not going to run down a whole list of things that you might be doing. We'll, we'll get to those in due time as we preach through the Bible, we preach through various sins in the Bible, but you just think about, I mean, the, the, the main thing is getting your attitude right about God, having a proper fear of God, and, and not treating your sins as being as flippantly as many people do. But I am going to preach on one thing that's specific here that I think the Bible gives good warning about of an area where you might lose your life if you're not doing this thing. Look at uh, Matthew 5, verse number 13. The Bible says, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. The Bible says, look, God's called us to be salt of the earth. And if you just think about salt just physically, you put it on food or whatever as a seasoning. It's also a preservative. When you put it on, say if the salt has lost its savor, if it's lost its taste, what's it good for anymore? Now it's just these little minerals, little pebbles that that aren't going to do anything good. It's not serving its purpose. So what do you do with that? If if it's lost its value, if it's lost its purpose, you're going to get rid of it. And the Bible saying, you are the salt of the earth. You have a purpose. You have a function. You have a job to do here. You're not doing your job. Well, what are you good for? See, God has a purpose for all of us. There is a reason for us being here, and it's not just to to eat, drink, and be merry. We have a much, much bigger job than that. Continuing on there in verse 14, it says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Turn if you go to Matthew 21. Matthew 21, we're going to see a concept here in two different places of bearing fruit. And... When fruit is not being born, when fruit is not being produced, the tree is no good. And we're going to see two examples here of God saying, of Jesus Christ saying, well, just get rid of it then. Matthew chapter 21, verse number 18. Bible reads, Now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. Jesus Christ got hungry as he is traveling and returning into the city. It says, And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on the ends forward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. Jesus Christ was hungry. He was looking for some fruit. He went to the trees. Oh man, there's a fig tree over there. Good. Because I'm hungry. Now I can get some figs. He goes to the fig tree and says, Where's the fruit? You're supposed to be producing. What do you do? You know, what are you good for, fig tree? You're not even you know, doing what you're supposed to be doing. That the job of the fig tree is to produce figs. I mean, we have fruit trees that we that we've grown in our house, and I'll tell you what, if they don't produce fruit, we're getting rid of them. The whole reason we bought fruit trees is so that we can get the fruit off of those trees and use them for ourselves. So this is the example that's being uh, brought forth here. It says in verse 20, And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. In all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Turn if you go to Luke 13. But the application that we can make on this is Jesus comes to this fig tree. He doesn't see the fruit on it. He goes looking for the fruit. Doesn't find it. He says, you're gone. We have fruit to bear as believers, as Christians. We have a job to do. And just like everything in the Bible brings forth after its own kind, that is the fruit. The fruit of the fig tree is figs because that's what it is. It's a fig tree. The, the fruit of a Christian is bringing forth other Christians. You are a believer. You need to bring forth other believers. That is the fruit. That is your reproduction. Because that's what fruit is. is is a reproducing of itself. The fig tree started from a fig seed 
in the ground, grew up into a tree to produce other figs, which will then many, you know, some of which will fall to the ground and then produce another fig tree, and on and on the cycle goes. We have that same job. Look at Luke 13, verse number 6. Luke 13, 6. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then... After that, thou shalt cut it down. I believe that these parables are warnings. They're saying, you know, if God comes to you and he's looking for fruit. Now, someone who's just got saved yesterday, a babe in Christ, is not going to be expected to just automatically be a tree that's producing fruit right away to where God's going to come and say, well, you just got saved yesterday. Where's your fruit? I'm taking you away. That's not the way it works. I mean, it it wouldn't make any sense. But for people that have been saved, for the time you ought to be teachers, you need one that teach you again, which would be the, the principles of God. When for the time you've been saved for a while, you ought to be a tree. You, know, you ought to have grown. And God, you know, and here we even see some more mercy. Say, you know what? Okay, wait. Before we get rid of it, we're going to dig. We're, we're going to try to help this tree to produce fruit. We're going to dig about it. We're going to dung it. We're going to provide the nutrition. Whatever it is that it needs to get to try to produce fruit. Okay, we're going to work on it. God doesn't just give up on you that easily. However, there is a point where God's, God could say... What are you doing? What are you doing? You're doing nothing for me. You're not preaching God. You're, you're not reaching other people. You're not living a life that, said, that, that shows that, you, that you're bringing a good testimony out of me. You're not doing any of these things. You're bearing no fruit. Why, why are you even coming around? Why are you even wasting space? Why are you even breathing the air? I'll just take you home. Because you're not doing anything. There's many ways to preach on the subject of winning souls to Christ. And there's, there's many motivations for doing it. And I, and I believe that there's, there's many good ways. I mean, we ought to have a good love for the lost. We ought, we ought to have a desire to serve God. We ought to want to earn rewards. We ought to want to do all these things. But we also ought to have a healthy you know, fear of the Lord. And take some of these admonitions to heart in these parables. Where he's saying, you know what? If I come seeking fruit and there's nothing there... What's it good for? And if, you, and if you're living a life and you're saved and you're a Christian, but you're not doing anything with that, what's it good for? What, 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 is, the, what is the benefit? I mean, besides the fact that, okay, you're not going to hell, what are you benefiting God? What, what, why should He keep you around in this life? What value are you to Him? I mean, if you're working, if you're producing fruit, God's going to be like, hey, great, let's, let's keep this going. You know, if we get, a, if we get a tree that's just really doing good, you know, we're going to be pruning it, we're going to be doing and really focusing on that and, and, and praising it and being blessed by that tree. And we're going to want to keep that around as long as possible. But if it's just doing nothing, if it dies, what, what is it good for Hopefully this sermon will do two things for you. Have a healthy fear of God in all aspects of your life and never be flippant about adhering to his word and an understanding, number two, the importance from all these New Testament scriptures on bearing fruit and making sure that you also are bearing fruit. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for your words, God, and for all these stories that we have here of individuals that have lost their lives for not listening to the Word of God and not treating you with with respect and um, 
God, I pray that you would please help us to understand your will, to understand what it is that you have us to do. We know already that, uh, that we ought to be bearing fruit. God, I pray that you please help us to do so and not to let our own fears or, or any other issues come in the way of us serving you, dear Lord. We want to be uh, very fruitful, especially here at Word of Truth Baptist Church, dear Lord. We want to be extremely fruitful for you. We pray that you would please just use us, help us to grow, help us to get the sin out of our life and to have a, a, a healthy fear of the Lord to um, to make sure that, that we are not going to um, be careless about your laws and, and about the way that we ought to be living. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.